I can just introduce my panel to you. We have Richa Carr from Zivami.com, Jalak Jobin Putra from Future Perfect Ventures, and Seri Chahel from Shiros.in. So just to begin this, I think it'd be a good place to begin by talking about failure itself. Because everyone talks about the success stories and what people do successfully. But failure and entrepreneurship really go hand in hand. So I was wondering if I can learn from this and go to each of you to ask, can you give us a few examples that you've seen of failure in your journey so far? Um, running a startup means you are experiencing failures every day. And I think um, um, failure at least gives you a sense of having tried. And that is important uh, than not having tried at all. Um, and if you are not uh, failing, you are not creating, you're not building. So for us, I, I wouldn't say if in my own personal context, I see failures as big or small. I, look, I deal with failure in as much uh, of um, indifference and apathy as much as I deal with success, is what I would say. But Jalak, you would have seen more, not personally maybe, but more other people and startups failing. And really, have you seen examples of people learning from it? Does it contribute in their future success? Yes, absolutely. So most of um, most uh, venture funded companies end up failing, uh, you know, in, in the term, uh, in the way we think about it. But uh, so many of those entrepreneurs that may not have succeeded in, in their first go around uh, end up starting companies uh, uh, where they do apply a lot of their learnings. And so that's one of the reasons a, a lot of venture capitalists like to back entrepreneurs who've done it before. And yes, it's helpful if they you know, took a company public, but it's just as meaningful or, or also meaningful if, a, if an entrepreneur knows why he or she didn't succeed the first time around and is, is hungry to try it again and apply those learnings and, and make a go of it uh, and, and succeed the next time around. Seri, you do have personal experience here. You talked about ventures that you have looked at. Can you tell us some about that? All right, so I did my first startup in 99. The company was fairly successful, and post which uh, there were two other ventures in the middle. Uh, uh, one was moderately successful, one was a super flop. Uh, I'm on to my fourth venture now. And the thing I've learned along the way is the ones that failed, or ones that failed miserably, didn't have as much of my passion or my ability to give it my all. Uh, as much as the one that succeeded. So that's one clear fit. And of course, then there are a lot of logical reasons why failures happen. Fits, teams, funding, markets, timing, execution, all of that is a given. But I think, uh, uh, and passion sort of brings uh, a story of persistence, right? And I think that's sort of what I've learned from failure, that if it has all what I got, uh, then it, it has a better chance to succeed. If my heart's not in it, then I'm not gonna sort of, it may just fail. It just has less soul. But it's interesting you mentioned passion. So if I, were, if I were to ask you to pin down certain characteristics that you've all seen in successful ventures, both in the founder as well as the company, um, shall we say the top three characteristics that a successful startup should have, can I just ask you to list some of those? I think, um, you know, what we call passion um, in Zivami, we call it a sense of purpose. You know, um, and that um, flows top down, right? So everybody in the organization at any level needs to have a sense of purpose. Whether you have a graphic designer or you have your head of business, they need to know what they are doing actually impacts and creates something bigger, larger than what they would have imagined. So that's one. The second is uh, a very strong sense of collaboration. Um, a startup is not really about one rock star, right? it's actually about multiple rock stars. And if you don't collaborate, you never, you will never, I, I feel you will never succeed. Um, the, the third is uh, um, a push towards uh, becoming better every day, every week, every month, every quarter, every year. Which means most people that join us can, when they, when they were to look back, would they say, I never thought I could do this. And this company, this team helped me or enabled me to do this. 
So it's very important to have a sense, a mentorship, a culture of around mentorship. I think these three things I would say would be very top on my list. But Jalak, if I can ask you, when you look at a company, um, do you look at the founder more or the company more? <laughs> that, that's the billion dollar question yeah. that uh, I always get asked. So, and it's a great question. And um, uh, you know, common wisdom is that if you have an A plus founder with a B idea, it's better than having a B founder with an A idea. And, um, you know, I, I think, look, uh, especially when you're investing at the early stage, uh, so much is going to change over the course of a company's evolution, right? I mean, Google did not start off uh, as, a, as a search engine. Um, and, and so uh, you do need to look for founders that, um, yes, are passionate about their idea, are dedicated to their idea, but also maintain enough flexibility to understand when it is time to pivot uh, and and, and uh, yet they don't give up too easily. So so that is a fine line, which you know not a, not everyone uh, can can tread that fine line. So um, I, I would say the founder is still the most important uh, piece of, of uh, you know of, of the evaluation. Uh, the idea matters. Uh, I'd say timing uh, matters a lot. Um, and, and there's so many ideas that I evaluated in 1999 and 2000 that are now just becoming feasible from a business uh, model perspective. And, and so that doesn't mean that these entrepreneurs, I mean, they had almost too much vision. They were too ahead of the time. And, and so uh, that, that's also something that's important in the evaluation. Sari, if I can ask you, I mean, do you look at the founder? Do you look at the company? What would be the, other than passion, but what would be the characteristic that you look for? I would sort of put persistence, 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 pretty much as the real deal, followed by the ability to build relationships and manage the timing. I think a lot of business success is all about market timing, managing a whole lot of uh, you know, uh, not only the internal organization play, but also the market play. Uh, I would sort of give it that. You know, you talked about timing. That brings me to the question that when startups, like you said, Google didn't start out as a search engine. So do you stay focused on one path or do you evolve as a company? I mean, it's not easy sticking to the original vision either, but do you stick to it or do you evolve? What would you give more credit to? So I think uh, if you know what is the problem you set out to build in the, to solve in the first place, uh, that itself is a very large hope that sets the tone of who you're going to be. And somewhere along the way, uh, the ability to very clearly say, you know, this deal is off if you know certain parameters kick in, or we are definitely not going to do A, B, C. You know, there there is always a way to stay in business. But when is it you say that this business doesn't? make me do as much? When is it that your passion runs out? Like in our business, we very, very clearly said, this is the large problem we want to solve. We are very happy to take very diverse approaches to solve it. Till such time, it stays true to the larger goal we set out to do. The day I think we stop doing that, or that sort of doesn't hold true, then we have to really reevaluate and say, do we still want to do it? Do we still want to stay as engaged? Do we break it down? But Jalak, you see a lot of them in the very early stages. And like you said, how much do they change? How much do they stick to the first kind of goal and the path that they started out with? Yeah, so I mean, one of the things uh, investors look for in entrepreneurs is focus, especially early on. It's that laser focus on, on doing one thing really well. And even if, and, you know, the challenge is we want to back ideas that are uh, multi-billion dollar ideas. So often, you know, that, that one idea morphs and grows beyond that. But what, what is important to see is that uh, a founder and a team uh, can execute on, on that one initial idea. And however long it takes to be able to do that, and we talk about product market fit, and there are a lot of terms for it. But um, you know, getting getting execution on one area is important, and then of course you want to see it grow beyond that. But Richard, do you think it's easy sticking to that first vision of yours and sticking to that path? Because it's easier said than done. That you know, can you really stick to it? I think a vision is always um, singular in many cases, right? And then you get people to co-own your vision. So the vision needs to be grand, it needs to be lofty, it needs to be futuristic. 
but um, in the entire process of uh, building that vision out, you will face headwinds or tailwinds, and therefore it is always important to keep tweaking it, keep refining your ideas, to keep close, getting closer. The path you will take will depend on the external circumstances, on your constraints, on your internal circumstances, etc. And therefore, I, I don't see it as, hey, are we doing something different than what we set out to be, etc. Even the most, um, what I like to feel is, if you, and to borrow from what uh, Sairi just told, you have to be resilient, right? And um, if, if you're not resilient, you're better off doing what the market leaders are doing and just endorsing them rather than doing something which is contrarian in nature and approach. But what about your teams? I mean, a lot of this, like you said, it's not one rock star, but you need a lot of rock stars. So what about your teams? Because especially in the Indian context, you have not had startups for too long. So the talent invariably come from traditional industry. So how do you get them to think more creatively, design thinking, innovative thinking? How do you change that in your workforce? Do you train them to be that? Or do you look for people who are already creative thinkers and hire them? So we go with, uh, our hiring philosophy is uh, um, based on two things. One is we look at uh, the will and the skill, right? And um, skill, uh, we feel, is easier to acquire. And, and in some cases, people will get on the job. But will is the most important thing. So when we hire people, we are actually thinking, will this person be relevant for us in the next three years? And I don't know what the business would be in the next three years or what challenges we will have. So for us, um, the, the will is more important than the skill. And um, therefore, what we are saying is, will this person have a sense of purpose when he or she comes and joins us? Uh, and that is what we are trying to evaluate as such. We're not really going by, hey, you've been there, done that, um, so you come and do the same thing here. Because then, you're really not create, having a sense of purpose, you're just doing a job. And these people will not stick to you. What about you, Sari? Do you think, I mean, it's important to change the way organizations work, maybe, you know, infuse that sense of creativity in them if they don't have it already? Absolutely. We are big fans of that. So we run a uh, career platform for women. A lot of our hires are actually from the platform. To us, what is the single most important thing is mission centricity. Do you get what we are doing? Can you help us creatively? Uh, and I think uh, when people come into startups, either they're looking to make their own road, they're also at crossroads. And if, if the crossroads between the startup and the person matches, you have great teams. Uh, and, and also people come in with two, two, two kind of backgrounds. People are specialists or people are generalists. So there will be startup people who will be your every new project rollout person. They are like potatoes in the curry. You can throw them anywhere. Whereas there will be people who will be specialists who will come with one very specific skill. They'll only know their SEO or analytics or whatever. And I think their mission centricity is slightly less, uh, or if, even if it's less, it's OK. But people who form the core DNA of the organization have to have very high degree of mission centricity. They have to be more into it than you are, because chances are you're going to be out of and you, you out building the market or investors or all of that. So it's the team actually who is really sort of, you know, propagating the mission in a big way. If I can bring this conversation back to you as individuals, Jalak, if I can start with you, what are the kind of challenges that you're facing, say even today, and how, how do you really overcome them? Well, as, uh, as an investor, you're in inundated with lots of business plans, um, ideas. Uh, I mean, there are a lot more that are fundable and that I would like to get involved in that I have the capacity to, to do. So I, you know, I always um, find that to be one of the most challenging and I'd say frustrating parts of the job. I, I love what I do. I can't believe I get to get up and do it every morning. But if there were one thing that I, I, I would change is um, you know the ability to scale uh, a, a lot uh, a lot more of, of what I do um, or or be able to kind of share my learnings back um, in in a broader way uh, with entrepreneurs um, and then I also think we're you know if I want to take it back and look at the macro environment we're in uh, we're going to be entering I think globally a more challenging year than uh, than we've had in years past and and so 
Um, you know, I have invested through two downturns of not 2001 and 2008, and I've seen this movie before, but there are a lot of folks out there that haven't. And so really helping them navigate this, uh, this cycle that we're about to see is, is one that, um, again, you know, it's just part of the job, but, I, I, you know, it's going to be a challenging year for a lot of folks. Yeah, it is, yeah. it is riding the wave, literally. Yeah. But Sari, um, in your job where you're trying to get more women into the workforce, India needs it more than ever with really poor kind of labor um, rates that we have. There are lesser women in the labor force today than it was 10 years wow. ago, surprisingly. Wow. But what are your big challenges and how do you overcome them? Um, so I think the first challenge we hope to resolve, I think we've got there, we want to be want people to stop thinking this was an NGO. You know, I think we are hardwired to think yeah. because we work with women, we must be running, you know, a self-help group or yeah. we must be sort of evangelical or we must be asking for donations. Yeah. It's very hard to say, yes, we're building a category, we're putting out a new way of doing things, we're building products around that. Yeah. And of course, I think uh, part of this is to keep adding people to the mission. Yeah, the more bright minds applied to solve a problem, the, the better we can get at it. Uh, so I think, uh, and of course mainstreaming it, you know, it's still a very elite conversation. It's still a conversation you and I have. And I think what we really want to do it is desify it in some way to say, hey, uh, even a person, even a woman who lives in a Champaran or a Thani or a Guntur, can have a conversation about her career. She may not use the term career. She may use a different term for it, but it still implies the same thing. It still implies the end impact. And, and I think large problem, we'll keep taking a shot at it. <laughs> Absolutely, like we've seen. I mean, it is profitable to work with women, to, be, to have more women in business, and Richard knows all about that. So if I can ask you, what is your big challenge? And um, how do you really overcome it? Uh, well, like, Today's challenge, um, as Jalak said, we are hearing winter is coming for all Game of Thrones fans here. Yep. <laughs> so um, we are all trying to now um, see if our, uh, you know, actually take a step back and think that are we building really businesses which will be future-proofed, will um, have uh, fan falling from our customers for the brand that they are and for the offering that we provide. And uh, for the teams who will stick to us, stick with us, because they absolutely believe in what we are creating. I think that is the most important thing for us right now because as a startup, um, uh, if the external environment changes, it really becomes very important to take stock of it and uh, start arranging yourself to brace yourself for the, for the hardships that would come. I guess that's the big takeaway, right? Is your business really future-proof? Well, Richard, Jalak, and Seri, thank you so much for joining me. You've been a wonderful panel. I think a great round of applause for the ladies. <laughs> yeah.